long you guys can tell me to wrap it up and I'm tired of hearing from you here, but I'll try to keep to my time. Um, so uh, again, my name's uh, Steve Ayer, uh, but this paper, I, I like to give credit where it's due. Uh, this paper was led by one of my graduate students, Rahimi Rahman. Um, he's a student of mine working on his PhD now, uh, and just sort of wrapping, or not wrapping up, entering his third and we think final year of his PhD. Um, and the title of the paper is Prevalent Issues in BIM-Based Construction Projects. Um, I guess I'd like to, to start off, um, before I get into the details of what he's done, to talk a little about the motivation behind this work. So, you know, we've seen a lot of studies recently, um, and many of which at this conference, talking about building information modeling either in terms of things we can do with technologies or potential value offered by BIM or some of the need for BIM in industry. Uh, we saw the presentation this morning from uh, Dr. Jaselkic who talked about um, some of the opportunities to keep our projects on schedule, on time, um, uh, and on, on budget, and some of the opportunities for BIM. And we've seen lots of studies that suggest this. The American Society of Civil Engineering has called for the need for BIM. Uh, we've seen many, many different studies that talk about various different values for BIM. Um, but, as we saw in the presentation this morning, when we look at data not in a laboratory setting, but data with companies and with actual data out there, seeing what's possible with BIM is not always what is actual or what is realized with BIM. But that's not surprising, right? If anyone here has uh, worked with BIM, uh, especially in practice with companies, you've probably seen this. That oftentimes, there are challenges with seeing these huge savings we've been um, sort of told in the research is possible. There's sometimes challenges with realizing that. And we've also seen some prior studies that basically examined this approach to say, what are the challenges that occur? What are the problems that can happen uh, with BIM in practice? And there's various different studies that have used uh, several different methodologies, and they've identified uh, a number of different challenges, whether it be technical or managerial, or issues with the people or the culture, uh, or change management, uh, differing expectations. We wanted to study this topic of identifying what are the issues that exist in industry that can hinder BIM uh, use in practice and identify what some of these challenges can be. But unlike some of the prior studies, we didn't want to simply ask people, uh, what do you see in your projects? That is a, a reasonable approach. I'm not critiquing their approach. But what we wanted to do is rather than say what is reported in terms of we think this could be a potential problem or we've seen this. We wanted to actually look at a company um, to see their problem logs and see what is actually shown and what are the actual issues that occur on a project. And from that, we wanted to identify what are the prevalent or common issues that occur on a project, what typically goes wrong with them, and also what are the underlying causes of the problems that we see. So we partnered with a company that's located, it's an electrical contractor. Uh, they're located in the southwest United States, uh, close to where we are at Arizona State University. And they shared with us what they would call their problem log. And their problem log is basically hundreds of line items on a spreadsheet, and it will have whatever the problem of the day is, or the problem of the moment is, entered by different people on the job, very unstructured data. We didn't really know how it would look like. So a problem could be, um, Jim didn't show up to the trailer today to deliver his model. Or it could be, so-and-so uh, is not paying attention on the job, and they're not building according to the model. It could be any of these things. The only manipulation that happened to the data before we got it was all the names of both people and projects were anonymized. So this company gave us their data and they said, here are the problem logs that we have. Um, see what you can deduce from this. So my student went through a, a, a process called thematic analysis, which is a structured approach of going through the data to try to identify from it what are the themes of the issues, what types of issues keep recurring on this project, and then also what are the causes of the issues that we can identify from the written documentation in the uh, problem log. And I'll go through kind of an example of uh, just a couple issues here because I think it helps to illustrate the, illustrate the point of what we were doing. So this is a lot of text, so I'll read it. Those of you in the back may not see it. Um, but the reason I'm putting all this text up here is this is what we were given. Verbatim, this is what we got from the contractors. And we got hundreds of line items that looked like this. And I'll show you two, just for the sake of example. So one might be, back in February, we sent a request asking for a lighting layout. It's an electrical contractor. Um, for level four to 38, we were told that level three can be copied up to the tower but once we hit level 34, there are larger units, and the door layout is different. So this is what we got from them. Uh, what we, the only thing we don't know about this is, like I said, if there were specific names mentioned, that was anonymized. <coughs> Other than that, this data was untouched. 
So we went through it and in this structured analysis said, in terms of identifying meaning units, what are the critical pieces of this? And so we tried to extract from all of this text, what is the simplest piece that highlights this issue? And it was told something could be copied, the layout in this case, but then somehow found out the layout was different. That's what we took as these are the, the pieces of meaning from this and said, <clears throat> this is in effect incorrect information that someone was given. We were told you can do one thing, but it turns out that's not the case for differing door layouts, whatever the issue was. And then we created a category to identify what is the type of issue that this was. And so we, suggest, we said we believe this is a human error. Based on the way this is worded here, it sounds like the issue was someone told us one thing and they were wrong. There's nothing about the writing here that says someone was trying to deceive someone or someone was trying to lie. And unless we were to introduce our own bias essentially to it, there's nothing that suggests that. So this appears to be an issue of human error. So then what we defined was uh, different categories of types of error. Uh, we used three categories that are somewhat common in this field of saying uh, causes of error can come from people, process, or technology. And so this one we said was under the people or human category. I'll show one more just for the sake of illustrating the process that we followed. Uh, another line item. Those currently in the project have ignored the recommendation of prioritizing tasks or actions. Those modeling the production model or updating the model after field installation to match what was installed. So I'm just at a casual level. We're BIMing after it's already been built in the field. It seems a little backwards, right? So from that, we deduced that uh, someone there ignored the recommendation on prioritizing tasks or actions. Again, our aim in this step was not to change the meaning, but just to extract what's the critical um, meaning unit from that. And then here it sounded like the initial coding that we said is um, based on the way this was written, we believe the, the action that occurred there was someone ignored a recommendation. And the category here then, unlike the last one where we said it was an error, someone said one thing, they just happened to be wrong, this one's more of, I had information um, and I'm just not following. Right? It's just a bit of a different, different situation. So this one we coded as individualized personalities. But even at that, if we look at the three causes that I talked about earlier, we were trying to group into people, process, or technology, we're still looking at a people issue there. Here again, could we have said, well, I think we could have had a technology that would have solved this? Maybe, but we would have been essentially changing the meaning of what was written in this problem log. So we tried very hard to not insert any of our own meaning, but only to interpret uh, what they had in these problem logs. So we, and I'm, I'm taking credit where I shouldn't, my graduate student did the, the heavy lifting on this, went through a couple hundred line items of problem logs and did this for each of them, right? A very structured approach of going through this process to identify these themes of issues that we found and trying to identify the underlying causes of issues that we found. And once he had done that, then it actually became uh, a little bit easier. Then he went through and said, let's see what we found. What are the trends in this? So we tried to categorize and count the findings uh, to identify what the prevalent issues are among all of the line items that we saw and the dominant causes. I should pause here to mention that when we looked at all of the different issues that arose from this real company, uh, while they're based in the southwest United States, this is their centralized BIM group for the whole nation. So their projects occurred throughout the U.S. and they also had several different projects on it. It was hundreds of line items, it wasn't hundreds of projects, I forget the exact number of projects. Um, some projects had multiple issues, obviously, um, but, but it had a, a lot of projects, so we thought it was helpful to get a better sense of how uh, this would indicate performance over the country. And what we found through doing this analysis, as I, I mentioned earlier, we were going to look at sort of three categories of, of people, process, and technology. And the types of issues that we found for the people side, we found issues related to human error. We saw an example of that. Communication. Uh, insufficient training or experience, and individual personalities. We saw an example of that one too. For process, the common results we found were related to information exchanges. So not the, not the people themselves, but the process of saying, on this date or that date, I owe someone information, and there is now a trade of that information between parties. Changes to the uh, design, we heard some about that uh, this morning in that keynote presentation as well, and how changes can impact a process. Uh, and then poorly defined processes. So not, a, not necessarily a bad process, but simply a lack of a process for something where people didn't know what was expected. On the technology side, we did see some issues as well. We saw issues related to technology not working properly or inefficiency. Um, so these all probably make some sense conceptually. I think where it starts to get a little bit more interesting is when we look at frequency of these challenges. 
If we look at this, you can see here, here's our original starting point. We started with 684 line items. These were individual problems, just like the ones I showed. And we went through all of these and tried to see how many occurrences of each type of underlying category here do we have that occur. And what we see is the majority happen in process and people, and actually a small minority happen in technology. Um, now again, it, for those of you that have done research with industry out there, I suspect this is not surprising. Um, if you've done work on actual projects outside of a lab setting, uh, a lot of times you can see the technology works, right? It does, it does the performance, it does perform the way it is supposed to, but oftentimes there's some other factor that may limit performance in terms of uh, people don't like it or don't use it, or there's not a process in place, and that kind of thing. And this basically showed this, um, backed up this, this suspicion here. Now, if we also look at the types of issues that were prevalent, one of the things was understanding the dominant causes, which here, by and large, people in the process, which are the main causes of the issues we see. But the additional thing that we saw was looking at the specific types of issues um, that are the most common that we see. And we see information exchanges, changes, human errors, individual personalities, and admittedly breakdowns on uh, the technology side also shows up. The reason that we've listed these here these essentially are the ones that did not have a statistically significant difference from the most frequent, most frequent one. So in this case, we've got information exchanges is the most frequent uh, occurrence that we have on our job. And basically all the others here did not have a significant difference from it. Uh, but there were others that I'll mention that while not significantly different, different still showed up frequently, uh, which were unfair processes, uh, insufficient training or experience, communications, or inefficient technologies. So what we drew from this, um, this may not be the, the most exciting piece of this, so I want to close, if I've got time, which I've got a few minutes here, uh, by talking about where we're headed. This is an incremental study, and it's one step I mentioned towards a PhD dissertation of my student, uh, and this will help to guide his work. His findings from this is that people in process, uh, when looking at inf information actually from a project, not just interviews, surveys, or reported content, but information from project are indeed the dominant causes of issues. Um, but this has implications for us as educators. He is looking into, he that my grad student is looking at how we educate our students about BIM. I said earlier that people in process are the dominant causes, and I suspect most of you um, are thinking, I could have told you that before you did this. That's um, sort of uh, obvious if you work in industry. What's concerning, or where I think there's an opportunity here, is while we may understand that about industry, if we look at academia and how we educate in BIM and academia, by and large, there is a focus on technology. Uh, now, I want to be clear, I am in no way suggesting that it's not important to study technology for students. It is. The companies want students to know how to use technology. But perhaps it's equally or maybe even more important for them also to learn about the people and process associated with technology use. So that's what he was interested in studying. Some of the things he's going to do uh, next. Is first, back up some of the findings from this paper with uh, inter uh, industry experts. Not necessarily saying do they agree that people in process is more common than technology. We think there's enough research out there to pretty uh, sufficiently defend that at this point. But to say the specific issues we found from this one company is uh, representative of the types of issues that others would see in other companies so that if we make an educational activity on this, it basically is plausible uh, that they could, students could see this. And then where we're heading in the future is he's already started making uh, a game, I shouldn't say game, it's more of an activity in class where students are going to learn what we're calling BIM without the BIM. And the idea of what we're doing is we're going to have students show up to class someday and we're going to say you're on a project, hypothetically, you're the project manager um, and you are here, you're running a BIM project but something went wrong today and you need to solve it. But oh by the way, you don't need to open any BIM software for this. This is a human issue. It's one of the things we found here. It's a model never got delivered on time. It's someone ignored the 000 origin point of our model and their, their content is off somewhere in space. It's something that is related to people or process, which are the common issues that we've seen, and then we challenge students to try to resolve it. We're using a problem-based learning methodology for this. Um, and the reason that we're trying to study this is we think if these are the common issues that arise in industry, if students can develop the skill sets in a safe academic setting to try to deal with these challenges, maybe they'll be more set up uh, to work professionally and have success in actually getting some of those benefits that we've talked about in a controlled lab environment, some of the research that looks at BIM. So this is kind of the aim of his work, studying BIM without the BIM. Um, and this, the study that I'm presenting today is kind of that first step in helping to guide what that activity will look like because it'll incorporate some of those issues into the activity. 
So with that, I think I'm right at about the 15 minute mark. I'll stop there and maybe take a question or two if, uh, if there are any, and then we'll move on to our next presenter.